Welcome and thank you for joining us for the first lecture of three for this semester series of lectures on the history and legacy of Black entrepreneurship in the United States, hosted by Princeton University's Keller Center. We started the series in the spring of 2021 and we are thrilled to be continuing it. I'm excited to tell you about this series first and to introduce you next to our amazing speaker, an incredibly interesting scholar, Dr. Clarissa Myrick Harris, Professor of Africana Studies at Morehouse College. My name is Isam Beezer, and I'm a university administrative fellow hosted by the Keller Center and a PhD candidate at Rutgers Business School, where I study entrepreneurship from both contemporary and historical perspectives. The center's mission is to aim our community with intellectual foundation, innovation skills, and networks to propel positive and sustainable societal, societal impact. As a center, we recognize the pervasive and system, systemic racial inequality in our country and how this is deeply linked to so many of our country's most profound challenges. We understand how important it is that our community has an understanding of these systemic inequalities as, they, as we work on solving some of humanity's most pressing challenges. Which, bring me, which brings me um, to this series of lectures. For all interested in innovation and entrepreneurship, much can be learned from the entrepreneurs who have succeeded under some of the most daunting of constraints. For at the end of the day, this is what entrepreneurship is about at its core. It's about assembling limited resources for impact. Um, you know, Black innovators and entrepreneurs have overcome restrictive markets, segregation, Jim Crow laws, lack of access to capital, threats of violence and death, theft of intellectual capital, and many other extreme challenges. Still, they thrived. These entrepreneurs have created innovations that have resulted in lasting societal and cultural change far beyond the Black community. By exploring the history of entrepreneurship and innovation, we want to learn from the creative strategies Black entrepreneurs employ to succeed. At the same time, we want to explore how the constraints on Black entrepreneurship and business development have limited overall the overall economics of not only Black communities, but our society as a whole, and how so many of these constraints, which have become institutionalized, can be overcome in the future. This exciting series of talks brings together scholars and academics from numerous institutions from around the country, uh, in fact, the world now, to share their scholarship in a discussion-based forum. Um, today's talk by Dr. Myra Harris is entitled Power to the People, love the title. But before I hand the room to today's scholar, please um, uh, please put your questions in a Q&A box. Okay, don't, don't put it in the chat if that's even an option. Um, we should have time at the end, at which point I will ask your questions. Your questions are the most important ones, uh, not mine or the Keller Center staff. So please do not be shy and, and put your questions in there and we'll make sure to address them when we have time. Uh, Dr. Clarissa Myrick Harris, a professor of um, academic studies and uh, at Morehouse College is the co-founder of the college's Black Men's Research Institute and principal investigator for the Morehouse Movement, Memory and Justice Initiative. Both are supported by grants from the Mello Foundation. Mellon Foundation, apologies. Myrick Harris's research focuses on the intersection of race, class, culture, and gender in the quest for social change and social justice, which with emphasis on leadership during the civil rights and black power movements. Her publications include Call the Women, the tradition of African-American female activism in Georgia during the civil rights movement. Um, in, in the book, Southern, uh, sorry, in the book, Southern Black Women in the Modern, uh, civil rights movement and behind this behind the scenes two women of the free southern theater um, see her recent historical context study for the national park service um, how they lived focuses on the family home of martin king jr and coretta scott king and the childhood home of the first black mayor of atlanta maynard jackson jr she's currently working on the edited volume keep pushing the atlanta student movement from quest um, for human rights to demand for black power. Now, without further ado, you've heard enough of my voice. I will pass it on to you, Dr. Myra Harris. Thank you so much. Thank you, Isam. It's a pleasure to be here. I've been anticipating this experience. Um, in doing this presentation, I was really e excited um, because it's um, provided me an opportunity to do two things. Um, I really focused on an aspect of my research for um, my, uh, the book I'm working on, writing chapters for and editing chapters for it. It will be an edited volume. So, um, and, and so the Black press is an important part of that history. 
But in, in doing this, um, putting this together, doing a bit more research, uh, I also connected to um, my roots. <laughs> um, I uh, was a, a minor in journalism in my undergraduate years. I um, majored in English at Morris Brown College in Atlanta, which is part of the Atlanta University Center. My master's is in journalism. Uh, and my PhD is in American studies with an emphasis on African-American studies. Uh, now we refer to it as Africana studies. And of course, I'm a professor in the Department of Africana Studies and History at Morehouse College. Um, and, and so this history is close to me because um, I have connections. I hesitated about talking about that because I guess I'm betray um, betraying my age, but that's okay. Um, the Atlanta Daily World is um, in, an important aspect of my history because I took a class from um, one of the reporters, a niece of the founder of the Atlanta Daily World, uh, who taught classes at Clark College when I was an undergrad um, at Morris Brown College. The Atlanta University Central Institutions share um, uh, courses and students go from one to the other. At that point in time, there were six institutions in the AUC. And so um, she asked if I wanted to do an internship. And I said, yes. And so I was a student intern uh, and, and really a, a full-fledged reporter for the Atlanta Daily World for about two years. And so in looking at the history, I've always smiled because I actually was in it. I experienced um, the publisher, C.A. Scott. Uh, I experienced one of the um, uh, reporters, really a very progressive reporter, Mr. George Coleman, who often butt heads with the publisher, the conservative, Mr. C.A. Scott. And so I had an opportunity to cover um, many of the important events and activities uh, in the city. My connection to the Atlanta Enquirer is through my research on the Atlanta student movement. Uh, and I have engaged with and still um, talk with regularly individuals who were on the staff of the Atlanta Enquirer when it was developed, when it was born um, in the early 1960s, in 1960, in fact. Um, and a, a gentleman named uh, Charles Black, who I'll refer to in my presentation, for instance, I just talked with last night just to make sure I had a bit of information straight in terms of the beginnings of the Atlanta Enquirer. Uh, my connection to the Atlanta Voice was that I, I went to elementary school with the publisher, the founding publisher of the Atlanta Voice, J. Lowell Ware. His daughter, who I went to elementary school, is now the publisher of that newspaper. So this history, again, is near and dear to my heart. So let me get started. Power to the People, the business of the Black press in Atlanta, Georgia, during the Black freedom struggle of the 1960s. A publication serving African-American communities have never been monolithic. During the intense period of the fight for social justice in the 1960s, there were three major black newspapers in Atlanta. They differed in nuanced and overt ways that reflected what they perceived to be the interest of their readerships during the period. The Atlanta Daily World was established in 1928 by William A. Scott. He was a Morehouse College graduate, so that's another connection, Morehouse College. Uh, and he graduated, he graduated from Morehouse College, uh, and he was a businessman. He was a publisher of the Atlanta Daily World until his murder, yes, his murder in 1934. And that crime was never solved. And so there's been speculation over the years about whether he was murdered uh, because of the content and the focus of the Atlanta Day of the World, or whether it was a domestic or family dispute. Um, and so that is still being debated. And so all these years later, that's still a mystery. Giving power to the people, the publishers of the Atlanta Daily World. Okay, and this is a quote from the first issue of the Atlanta Daily World in 1928. The publishers of the Atlanta Daily World have felt the need of a Southern Negro newspaper published by Southern Negroes to be read by Southern Negroes. Now, when the Atlanta Daily World was uh, established, it's not to say that there had not been uh, black newspapers in the city. There was actually one in operation and it became a competitor 
It competed with the Atlanta Daily World. That newspaper was the Atlanta Independent newspaper, which was established by a gentleman named Benjamin Davis in 1904. Uh, and so that newspaper um, had experienced a, a great deal of success. And Davis um, was an individ interesting individual, radical in many ways, um, conservative in others. He was a supporter of Booker T. Washington, uh, uh, Booker T. Washington, and he also um, was a nationalist of sorts. In his newspaper, he published articles uh, about a project that he had undertaken uh, in rural Georgia to build a black city. Uh, and so because he was emphasizing nationalism and separatism, he did not re really receive any flack from the white community. And plus, he had been validated by Booker T. Washington. So here comes the Atlanta Daily World, a competitor in 1928. Three years, well, actually five years later, about five years later, the A Atlanta Independent closed its doors and no longer existed. So Atlanta Daily World won that fight. Its beginnings, the Atlanta Daily World was founded as a weekly Atlanta, called the Atlanta World, on August 5th, 1928, by William Alexander Scott, who was only 26 years old at the time. Uh, the Morehouse graduate um, worked as the only Black clerk uh, on the Jacksonville to Washington, D.C. rail line. And then in 1927, uh, he published the Jacksonville Business Directory for uh, Black business people to help the, those individuals to connect. And a year later, he published a similar directory for Atlanta. Initially, the Atlanta World, you know, as I said, competed with the Atlanta Independent Newspapers, um, or Independent Newspapers, just in one paper. The Atlanta World became a semi-weekly in May of 1930 and a tri-weekly in April of 1931. And in 1931, Scott also began circulating the Chattanooga Tribune, the Memphis World, and the, uh, well, I said the Chattanooga Tribune and the, and the Miss, Miss Memphis World, two papers. And so by doing so, he established the beginnings of the first chain of African-American newspapers. And eventually that chain by the 1940s included 50 newspapers that were part of the Scott family syndicate. The world became a daily newspaper on March 13, uh, 1932. It was the first black daily newspaper in the country. And it was set apart from other black newspapers, uh, the majority of which were weekly newspapers. So Scott bought the printing press uh, of uh, the insurance company Standard Life, which um, had gone out of business. And he used subscription agents to go door to door to develop his readership that eventually stretched beyond um, Atlanta. He also promoted the paper as a business venture rather than as a political mouthpiece. Therefore, he was able to attract advertising from both black and white businesses, including national companies such as Sears, Coca-Cola, uh, along with the uh, prominent local, uh, along with prominent local businesses such as Rich's Department Store, and that's important to remember because Rich's Department Store um, uh, plays a role in the unfolding of the civil rights movement struggle in Atlanta in the 1960s. Uh, white businesses did not feel unduly threatened by the paper's editorial position, as they might have with a uh, black newspaper such as the Ch Chicago Defender or the Negro World. Uh, the Negro World was Marcus Garvey's paper, the Chicago Defender, uh, published by Robert Abbott. Um, those papers were considered militant in their attacks against Southern white racism. Um, the voice of the Atlanta Daily World was not passive, however. The paper advocated for civil rights for African-Americans in the 1930s and the 1940s within the context of um, a process called the Atlanta Way. Um, no independent circulation figures exist for the Atlanta Day of the World, but according to the Scott family, uh, by mid-1940s, its circulation uh, for that paper the, alone, the Atlanta Daily World, was at 28,000. The Atlanta Way, and I'll just talk briefly, I'll, uh, digress for just a second. In Atlanta in 1906, there had been um, a, a race massacre. 
Uh, and that massacre occur occurred ultimately because of uh, white supremacists fear of black power, uh, black voting power, and also the economic advancement of African-Americans in the short time since the end of the Civil War. Uh, and so uh, the spark that ignited that massacre were false claims in the white newspapers of the city. Those newspapers were used as the mouthpieces for the two candidates for the, for the governor, uh, for the gubernatorial race, um, Hoke Smith, and Clark Howell. Clark Howell was affiliated with the Atlanta Constitution. Hoke Smith was uh, affiliated with the Atlanta Journal. They used those papers to really fan the flames of discontent, of racism, uh, and they, um, they really riled uh, the white community up so that on September 22nd, 1906, uh, a throng of about 10,000 white men and probably some women in there too, although that's not talked about as much, from all stratas of society in Atlanta, from working class, from farmers to uh, business people, they formed a mob and they went through the central business district where African-American businesses were located in competition with white businesses. And they beat and killed as many, uh, well, we have documented 25 people were killed, but there were probably many, many more. And so you had that kind of threat of violence in the face of black progress that happened routinely. So that the fact that a newspaper could exist, a newspaper could be established in the late 1920s and not only be established, but also uh, become really a, a voice um, calling for Black voting power, also calling for uh, non-discriminatory treatment in all aspects, all sectors of society. The rise of C.A. Scott. Okay, after the death of his brother, W.A. Scott, Cornelius Adolphus Scott took over as the publisher. And he advocated for Black rights within the Atlanta way. I think I skipped over um, oh, there, I did skip over it. Um, I, I did go through this, but I wanted to point out this image, this picture. Uh, this is a picture of the Scott family. And you'll see um, directly behind the mother, Emmeline Scott, um, her four sons. And to the right in the center, the one directly behind her on the right, that's W.A. Scott. And then to his uh, left um, and your right from the, the screen, is C.A. Scott. And W.A. Scott credited his mother, Emmeline, with really being the inspiration and the driving force behind the paper. Um, so just wanted to mention that because often when we talk about business enterprises, publications, uh, whatever, the emphasis is always on that Black male presence and women seem to take a back seat, even though they are influential in the development of these publications and of course other businesses. So the Atlanta Daily World covered the news on a national ba basis, okay? In addition to talking about local events, but because of the Atlanta way, and I didn't finish that story, the Atlanta way developed in the wake of the Atlanta race massacre. It was a time when the white power structure called into um, meetings, you know, backroom negotiations, meetings. They called into these meetings Black leaders in the Atlanta community. And so they decided they would establish this way of negotiating for change, for incremental change within the white power structure, within the segregated system. And examples of that, for instance, would be um, Black leaders were able to negotiate for the hiring of Black policemen which did not occur until 1948. They were able to negotiate for um, the increase in housing for African-Americans. In Atlanta, there was a, a changeover from in some communities on the West side in particular, from all white communities to all black communities in the blink of an eye almost, most, just an, uh, a few short years, it was organized. Um, and there were reasons for that, of course, underlying reasons was they, that those communities often were a part of um, the plan, zoning and planning 
um, uh, zone and um, plans for the city that included the interstate. And so some of those streets in the West Side communities were taken by the interstate and African-Americans had to sell those homes um, un under the market value um, because they were considered in the public domain. But I digress. So the Atlanta Daily World advocated for change um, in the 1930s, in the 1940s. They uh, covered uh, stories about lynchings, police brutality, capital punishment, black on black crime. Um, and in the 1930s, they published articles about the Scottsboro boys, and those were nine black men in Alabama, really teenagers, who were accused of raping two white women. They spoke out about racial discrimination in the federal government. They spoke out about the white primary system in Georgia, which was abolished in 1946. They spoke out about school desegregation, racial discrimination against African-Americans in the US military, military during World War II. Also, the Atlanta Daily World was the first black paper to have a White House correspondent in 1944. And the New York Times actually wrote um, the historic moment was documented um, in, in he, when the uh, writer said, Harry McAlpin, the only Negro yet to be accredited as a White House correspondent, attended his first press conference today. He represents the Atlanta Daily World and the press service of the Negro Newspaper Publishers Association. So the Atlanta Daily World made history. But what happened in the 1960s? Uh, well, um, the writer Thomas Aiello, who has written uh, a wonderful book on the history of the Atlanta Daily World, The Great Vine of the South, the Scott Newspaper Syndicate in the Generation Before the Civil Rights Movement. And in that book, he says, integration and the fight for it was a divisive issue for the Black press. While the idea of equality was paramount to the papers, the idea of integration was an inherent threat to their survival. In 1947, for example, the Black press was doing inarguably, um, un unarguably well with some papers maintaining record circulation numbers. By the end of the 1960s, however, Black press circulations had dipped to between 50 to 75% of those numbers. So the, the, the tension that existed um, within the Atlanta Daily World was around the, uh, the, what was going on, current events, the direct action campaign of the civil rights movement unfolding through the Atlanta student movement uh, and, and other um, activities that were going on. Atlanta was the headquarters um, in the 1950s, beginning in 1957 for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which was led by Martin Luther King Jr. Martin Luther King Jr. came back to Atlanta after his successful, after the successful Montgomery bus boycott in 1960. So we have the convergence, the, um, the, the coming together of a number of factors that made Atlanta really a, a center, a cradle of the civil rights movement. By the 1960s, however, after uh, being yeah, and on the forefront of the call for desegregation, voting rights, um, an increase in housing, black police, speaking out against police brutality, he did a 180 and he opposed the sit-ins, boycotts and marches led by the students of the Atlanta University Center and other direct action protests in Atlanta and throughout the South. Keep in mind, 1960 was a, a pivotal year in Greensboro, South Car North Carolina, uh, excuse me, Greensboro, North Carolina. There had been a sit-in staged by four young men in February of 1960. Um, and they sat in at the Woolworths lunch counter in Greensboro. Um, and they were there to be served. Of course, they were not. And they were spat on and cursed um, but um, they were making a point and they returned and other students returned. And when students in Atlanta and the institutions of the Atlanta University Center saw the news stories, they were inspired to do the same. Um, and Scott, C.A. Scott, in the face of these um, uh, demonstrations, marches, sit-ins, boycotts of white businesses, he said that uh, challenging school de desegregation, voter registration, and the growth of Black wealth 
through business ownership would be more effective strategies for ending racial oppression. Um, Scott also feared, of course, losing advertisement from white businesses if the paper supported these kinds of civil rights demonstrations. Remember, one of his major supporters was the uh, regional um, successful department store, Riches. Riches department store was the major, major um, department store business, white business that um, the students zeroed in on for their boycotts and sit-ins. Okay. And so that was the tension that existed with the Atlanta Daily World. So although it had been on the forefront of demanding social change in the 19, late 1920s, 30s, and 40s, by 1960, it had uh, just made an about face and was the most regressive um, of the newspapers in the city of Atlanta. The, and of, of course, it was the only one at that point. And so um, in 1960, the same year that the Atlanta student movement was born, um, and they were born in February, March of 1960, by July of 1960, they established the Atlanta Inquirer. The city had three major news sources in 1960, the Atlanta Journal, still the Atlanta Constitution, as I mentioned before, and the Atlanta Daily World. And so the student movement was not covered widely by the white newspapers, and it was not covered by the Atlanta Daily World. Uh, early in 1960, the Committee on Appeal for Human Rights, the organization of the Atlanta student movement, created a newsletter to report on events and plans. And it was called the Student Movement and You. It was a mimeographed um, uh, handout. It looked like a, almost like a flyer. But before the year it was out, they were actually able to establish a real newspaper, okay? In July, 1960, the African-American owner of an Auburn Avenue print shop. Now, Auburn Avenue, uh, for, for those of you who are not familiar with Atlanta, was the hub of the black community. After, after the 1906 Atlanta race massacre, Many businesses uh, left. However, many businesses still remained in the central business district on Peachtree Street, which was uh, adjacent, really intersected Auburn Avenue. But Auburn Avenue from the end of the 19th century on to mid 20th century um, was the, the hub the, uh, of, of most of the business activities of African-Americans in Atlanta. In fact, uh, in the mid 1950s, Fortune Magazine called Auburn Avenue the richest Negro street in the world, not the country, in the world. And so you had a number of successful Black businesses on Auburn Avenue. And for a moment, for a period of time, the Atlanta student movement was um, in offices on Auburn Avenue. They got kicked off the campuses of the Atlanta University Center because they refused to kick out white students from the organization. There were some white students in the Atlanta student movement. The administrators of the Atlanta University Center, the presidents of those six colleges and universities wanted them to, um, to dismiss the white students because they were afraid that there might be some communist influence. Uh, you have to uh, keep in mind that this was um, not very long after uh, the McCarthy era and the witch hunt for a communist in the country. Uh, and so they, the students were in an office space on Auburn Avenue. Um, Mr. Kosuth Hill was in a print shop, not nearby. And so he came to the office of the Atlanta Student Movement, spoke with the leader, Lonnie King, not related to Martin Luther King, but a member of King's Church. And he said to them that he had a, uh, he, he had a printing press, and also he had established a newspaper called the Atlanta Inquirer that he really wasn't doing anything with. It was more or less defunct. Uh, and so he, he made a proposition. Um, you can print your paper, you can print a paper using my press and you can take the name, the Atlanta Inquirer. And so they agreed. The staff was comprised of AU Center and high school students, faculty from the Atlanta University Center and teachers from Price High School, uh, such as the woman you see at the top here, Janelle, Jundell Johnson. 
uh, who also went on to become a prominent to become a prominent civil rights uh, activist um, affiliated with the NAACP. Uh, well, she was one of the writers. The gentleman you see here, um, Jesse Hill who was the chief executive officer of the Atlanta Life Insurance Company. Herman Russell, who was a very successful businessman, construction and development. Leroy Johnson, who would a few years later become the first black state senator in Georgia since uh, reconstruction, well, since um, the, the last um, black senator had left in office in 1907, so it was uh, right after. Uh, reconstruction, but it had been that long, almost 60 years. And so these individuals came together to provide the support needed, the financial support needed to establish the Atlanta Enquirer newspaper for the vo as the voice of the students who were doing direct action, activism, demonstrations, um, sit-ins in Atlanta. So a newspaper is born and you'll see the, this is an image here, um, of the first issue of the Atlanta Enquirer. Individuals who worked for the newspaper, these were some young guys, students. Um, at the top here, Julian Bond. Julian Bond would go on to become a state legislator in Georgia. And um, in later life, he became um, the, the head of the NAACP. But during this period, he was a leader in the Atlanta student movement. And as a part of his duties, he worked as a, a writer for the Atlanta Enquirer. The young lady at the top is a young woman named Charlene Hunter. Um, she uh, worked at the Atlanta Enquirer as well. Um, and she worked there before she became one of the two first black students admitted to the University of Georgia. The gentleman at the bottom here, he's older of course, and he was actually the editor of the paper, and he was a, an English professor at Clark College, um, and it was Clark College at that time. Today it's Clark Atlanta University. But Mr. Carl Holman, uh, again, an English professor, was the editor initially. Later, Julian Bond became the editor of the paper. So you had a student uh, who um, was um, leading the paper and, and, and also the boss uh, of uh, some of the writers who were teachers at the, uh, in schools at Atlanta University Center and uh, Price High School. But the faculty, the adults worked for the paper part-time. Um, the New York Times in 1960 called the Atlanta Enquirer the loud voice in Atlanta. Uh, in the fall of 1960, the Atlanta Enquirer endorsed Democratic U.S. President uh, presidential nominee, rather, John F. Kennedy, although Richard Nixon was a favorite among the majority of Black Atlantans. Yes, in 1960, Richard Nixon was the man for most African Americans because he was a part of the party of Lincoln, the Republican Party. Things flipped after 1960 and the election of, uh, of John Kennedy to the presidency so that moving forward, uh, the Democratic Party became the party of African Americans. But up until that time, it had been the Republican Party. And only one other time in that in history did African Americans rally behind uh, a Democratic candidate for president, and that was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So this was um, quite unusual. Now, the reason for that uh, was that Martin Luther King Jr. had participated in one of the Atlanta student movement demonstrations in one of the sit-ins and he was arrested along with students. He was not released, however, he was sent to Reedsville Penitentiary uh, because he was the leader of the civil rights movement, the national civil rights movement, and also because he had not had time to get a Georgia and a uh, license. He still had his Alabama license. And so for that, they sent him to the penitentiary. He said afterwards that he thought he was going to die. They got him at that time. They put, got him, put him in the paddy wagon with a snarling dog in the dead of night. Um, the family of King didn't know uh, what to do. They called Nixon because Nixon had promised to be uh, the man for promoting Black voting rights and civil rights. But there was silence from the Nixon campaign. On the other hand, when they went to Kennedy, 
Kennedy actually personally called Mrs. King and his brother, Robert, um, and others negotiated and talked to the judge who had sentenced King to Reesville, and they were able to get his release from prison. Moving forward, Daddy King, that's Martin Luther King Sr., Martin Luther King Jr.'s father, and civil rights leaders across the nation rallied behind Kennedy. Kennedy's campaign uh, created a, a brochure very quickly. They called it the Blue Bomb. And in that um, campaign literature that was distributed throughout the Black community, especially through the Black churches, they outlined, um, they, first of all, they, they talked about the fact that they had facilitated the, the release of Dr. King. And then they talked about all the things they would do to promote civil rights for African-Americans. So what happened in that election, it was an election year, you know. Um, so in November of 1960, the black vote flipped from the Republican party to the Democratic party. And that was in large measure because of the activism of the Atlanta, of the Atlanta student movement and the advocacy and the news stories that were um, in the Atlanta Inquirer newspaper that was picked up. Those stories were often picked up by other newspapers, other black newspapers and sometimes other white newspapers. And here you see a political cartoon by um, the uh, political cartoonist Maurice Pennington with the Atlanta Inquirer. Pennington and others on the staff of the Atlanta Daily World were also employees at the Atlanta Life Insurance Company. The Atlanta Life Insurance Company, which was headed by Jesse Hill, was a big supporter of the civil rights movement. I mean, they supported financially and they supported morally and they actually had, they offered human resources like their, their employees to assist with the, um, the publication, the advertising, the circulation, the garnering of the circulation advertising that he needed. They uh, worked hand in hand with the, the students uh, and the, the faculty staff members of the Atlanta Enquirer. Uh, and so the Enquirer became a paper of influence. Um, in 1962, Morehouse Sr. and uh, the gentleman who was the chair at that time of the Committee on Appeal for Human Rights, that was the organization of the Atlanta student movement, Charles A. Black, became the editor of the Atlantic Inquirer. Um, and as I said, I was just talking with him um, just last night. And he said, um, the Atlantic Inquirer was a crusading newspaper that took on civil rights and human rights causes. Previously in the 1940s and 50s, the Atlanta Negro Voters League had galvanized the black electorate and provided recommendations for a slate for local, state and national offices. Uh, and but these were only white candidates at that time. On uh, it, it, that was the the circumstances. There were no black candidates. Black people barely barely had the the um, the right to vote. They had been dis, uh, disenfranchised in so many different ways. But they were able to hold on to a degree of of um, voting power. And so uh, the Atlanta Negro Voters League had pulled the black electorate together, and they bargained. They used their voting power to lobby for incremental kinds of changes in the Black community. Again, that was a part of the Atlanta way. Uh, but now, in the early 1960s, the Atlanta Inquirer took on that role. And so in its pages, it would talk about the candidates and which candidates uh, would really um, try to do something to promote civil rights for African Americans and which ones were uh, overt uh, white supremacists. And so they came up with a slate of candidates. But now, beginning in um, 1962, 63, they could include in their slate of recommended candidates, Black candidates. Because uh, in 1962, um, Leroy Johnson, who was one of the individuals who supported the Atlanta Inquirer, became a candidate for the state Senate. And so the inquiry used its, its um, stance uh, and its position as a progressive newspaper to support Leroy Johnson. Soon after in um, the next election, 
there were um, there was a slate of even more black candidates for local and state offices. And so the black electorate, as much as 90 percent of the time, followed what the Atlanta Inquirer recommended in terms of which candidates to vote for. With the experience he gained in part at the Atlanta Inquirer newspaper, Julian Bond, who was one of the earlier um, editors, who was the editor right before Charles uh, Black, in, fi in, in fact, he went on to become the communications director of um, the, the new organization, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Now, that was a national student organization. Many of those in leadership of SNCC were also in in leadership positions of the Atlanta student movement. So you see the activists, the student activists in the city of Atlanta um, had a, a great deal of clout, um, a, great, a great deal of expertise um, and accomplished a great deal in uh, the 1960s, especially the first half of that decade. So Julian Bond cultivated relationships with the reporters at national news services and newspapers fed them news stories about student activism uh, and violations of civil rights, uh, racial terrorism. And so in that way, the nation was made aware of what was going on in the South, especially Atlanta, but then also in other parts of the South uh, through the, the SNCC newspaper. They had a newspaper as well. But Julian Bond, again, uh, got a great deal of his experience while working for the Atlanta Inquirer. Although the Atlanta Inquirer's target market was the Black community, local white politicians also read the paper to gauge the attitudes of African Americans. When Atlanta Mayor Ivan Allen, for instance, erected what the Inquirer editor, Charles Black, called the Atlanta Berlin Wall, I didn't include a picture of that, I meant to do that, but he actually had um, constructed very hastily this makeshift um, wall, barrier, wood and steel, and put it across uh, the front of the, the street of this community. It was symbolic, of course, you could go over it or uh, go under it or whatever, but essentially it was a barrier telling black people, you cannot buy houses, you cannot live in this neighborhood because it is a white neighborhood. Um, and when, and this is the, the mayor of the city, Ivan Allen, who later would be called a progressive mayor, but at this point, not so much. And so, Charles Black wrote an editorial in which he dubbed that wall created by Ivan Allen, Atlanta's Berlin Wall. That was picked up by the national media and um, Ivan Allen was eventually chained into having that Berlin Wall um, dismantled. Journalism historian Roland Walsley credits the Atlanta Inquirer with playing a key role in getting Grady Hospital to end its segregation of Black patients and to give Black doctors privileges in that hospital. The Atlanta Inquirer, again, as an organ of the student movement, working in conjunction with the Atlanta Student Movement and the national organization, SNCC, um, they were able to, um, to rally the, the sentiment, um, the support of the community, and it also received national attention. And so um, Grady Hospital uh, was desegregated by 1965. The next newspaper we're talking about here is the Atlanta Voice. The Atlanta Voice was established in 1966, May of 1966 by uh, two gentlemen, Ed Clayton, who was a newspaper man, and J. Lowell Ware, who was a community activist, who, by the way, had also at one point been the publisher of the Atlanta Inquirer. And so he was continuing his involvement in journalism by establishing with Ed Clayton, the Atlanta Voice. And they had, uh, a, a, they, they defined their mission, uh, which um, had been the publications, it's been the publication's motto ever since. Their mission was um, to really give a voice to black people, hence the Atlanta Voice and quoting, a people without a voice cannot be heard. Unfortunately, um, Ed Clayton passed after the first issue of the paper was published. Um, J. Lowell Ware then became the, the publisher. Um, and for a long time, he served as editor, writer, but slowly he began to build 
a staff. And this is an older picture of Mr. Ware. Um, the, um, the, the vision, and I've already said that, the, the vision, um, their motto was, a people without a voice cannot be heard. Whereas the Atlanta Daily World represented the old guard of the civil rights movement and the Inquirer was the mouthpiece of student activists and so-called young Turks who emerged in the 1960s. Was, these were the young businessmen. And at the time that included Jesse Hill, uh, Herman Russell uh, and others. The Atlanta Voice was conceived to reflect the concerns and actions of the diverse black community. Um, as the civil rights movement ebbed, the integrationist thrust of the civil rights movement ebbed, and the Black Power era emerged, which was more nas nationalistic, more militant, and uh, more demanding in terms of the need for Black rights change, social change, the end to systemic racism now, immediately. Um, and it was, um, the voice was reminiscent of the Scott family syndicate of newspapers in that he published seven newspapers throughout the state of Georgia and Alabama. This is um, Mr. Ware. He published the Atlanta Voice, the Athens Voice, the Macon Voice, the Tuskegee Voice, the Pensacola Voice, and the Interscholastic Journal, um, as well in addition to the Atlanta Inquirer. Uh, and they walked the they walked the talk. Uh, Mr. Ware was very much a proponent of an activist. Uh, when it came to community development, especially around providing homes for the community. Uh, so in 1972, he actually moved his newspaper offices into what's called the Mechanicsville neighborhood. It's a depressed area in the city of Atlanta. Now it's going through um, a, a phase of gentrification, of course. Um, so after 15 years of decline at that point, the population, um, declining the population and closing of many community businesses, Mr. Ware came in with his business and vowed to rebuild the community. Uh, and like many communities in America, black communities in particular in the, in the 1970s and 80s, it was nearly crippled as property owners fled the inner cities. Um, and what he did was to establish the Summit Community Development Corporation to serve as a leader in community development initiatives to build economic sustainability, affordable housing in the Mechanicsville community. So what's the legacy of these three newspapers, these three businesses that were created to not only try to be successful businesses, but to really help advance the fight for social change and social justice? Yes, even the Atlanta Daily World up to a point. Um, all three newspapers were hit by the tech revolution that ended hundreds of newspapers in the United States, really thousands. Yet all three newspapers have been saved by digital media. All three newspapers still exist and continue to see the black community as their primary audience. Uh, but now not only Atlanta, their reach extends regionally, nationally, and even internationally. The Atlanta Daily World, uh, after, for example, after Cornelia Scott, C.A. Scott, the conservative, retired in 1997, his great niece, Alexis Scott Reeves, took over as publisher. She had been a journalist for a number of years at the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, the white newspaper in the city. And later she was vice president of community affairs for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. Um, when she uh, took over, the, the uh, circulation of the newspaper had taken um, a nosedive. During the 80s and 90s, the newspaper circulation declined from a peak of 20,000 in the 60s uh, to about 10,000. By 2000, although it retained the word daily in its name, it had cut back its publication schedule to only two editions per week on Sundays and Thursdays. But then in 2012, the Atlanta World joined Real Times Inc. This was a publisher of five other African-American weeklies, including Chicago, the Chicago Defender, the New Pittsburgh Courier. So the Atlanta Daily World joined that, um, that um, conglomerate of newspapers. Uh, Alexis Scott said the sale would give the world more multimedia resources. He called it a truly new beginning for the paper. Um, and Real Times Media 
um, was led and is led by African-American CEO Hiram Jackson. The Atlanta Inquirer. Today, the readership, uh, we are told by the uh, distribution company um, that, um, that, that distributes it and, and markets it, Echo Media, we're told that its readership is over 200,000, over 61,000 paid subscribers, and that's been verified. So the Atlanta Inquirer went from um, less than 10,000 subscribers in 1960 to today, over 200,000. The Atlanta Choir is marketed again and is distributed by Echo Media, and it, quote, is continuing to provide a voice for the voiceless and, in general, a community outlet for the people in the new millennium. It has over 100 uh, distribution locations, um, and over 72 percent of metropolitan Atlanta's African-American community are among its readers. Uh, the newspaper advertising in, influences 62% of its readers, and so it's doing very well. The Atlanta Voice today, after the death of publisher J. Lowell Ware in 1991, his daughter, Janice Ware, became the publisher of the paper. Um, she's a graduate of um, the business school at University of Georgia, and she worked um, alongside her father and was trained by him. This is the young lady I went to elementary school with. Uh, as one of the largest audited African-American newspapers in Georgia, with a 24-7 online presence and distribution throughout Metro Atlanta, the Atlanta Voice is distributed free of charge at over 150 commercial outlets, news boxes, and local libraries. So the Atlanta Voice has remained family-owned, the Ware family, um, and um, Janice Ware, uh, again, is the publisher um, as the premier African-American-owned news weekly in the U.S., um, they are masters now of social media uh, and online content, and they possess a combined monthly reach, get this, a combined monthly reach of 583,900 with a weekly in-print circulation, uh, in-print circulation, that means hard copy and actual newspaper, of 13,550. So they are... They have extended their reach really globally uh, to touch half a million people. Not only do we offer a variety of print publications that provide extended opportunities to engage our readers, we also maintain a robust digital footprint on leading platforms. Okay, so the best of both worlds, the United States has lost almost 2,000 papers since 2004 alone, including more than 60 dailies. And 1,700 weeklies, roughly half of the remaining 7,000 or so in the uh, newspapers in the countries, in the country, uh, about 1,000 dailies and uh, almost 6,000 weeklies are located in small and rural communities. While the transition uh, from, that should be from, print to digital media as the preferred mode of delivery of news has led to the demise of thousands of papers since the last decades of the 1920s, of, of the 19th of the 20th century, um, of the 20th century, um, the Atlanta's Black press has remained tenacious, evolving from print to primarily digital formats has perhaps been the saving grace and even an equalizer for the Atlanta Daily World, the Atlanta Inquirer, and the Atlanta Voice. Indeed, their digital presence is on par or even uh, in some cases, exceeds that of some of the larger mainstream online newspapers. And what about the content? Who's their audience? Millennials, Gen Zers, as well as baby boomers. Um, and not all uh, will continue to meet the needs. Uh, will they all continue to meet the needs of their and expectations of their readers? Sorry for that typo. Uh, so th those are questions um, for my future research projects. Um, and so the, uh, oops, it came out of, and that's it, but I want to get back in there. Okay, so um, the websites for the papers uh, today are, are here, and I'll make sure that um, we have a digital version of the, um, does you have a digital cop a copy of this PowerPoint? Can you see this website? Yes, we see it. Okay, so this is the website for the Atlanta Daily World. 
Um, and you see that it is, okay, it's busy, has a lot going on, but this is similar and I won't show all of them, um, but each of these three newspapers continues to exist and, and they are thriving. So, uh, and I know my time is just about up. Sorry, I went over the 40 minutes, but I'm ready to take any questions. Thank you so much. No, this time is for us to listen. So no, this is amazing. Thank you so much for an insightful and really important lecture. We have a few questions before we wrap up. Um, the first one is, uh, thank you very much for the captivating historical view of black newspapers in Atlanta. How did the newspapers extend their research beyond Atlanta during the pre-internet era? That is a very good question. Uh, and so as I, uh, I think I mentioned, yes, I did. The Scott newspapers, uh, the Atlanta Daily World, um, remember there, there was a whole syndicate. So um, William Scott and um, W.A. Scott and C.A. Scott, they were shrewd businessmen. And so they had um, um, a Daily World uh, newspapers in uh, other southern cities in Birmingham and Memphis. And then they also published, they printed newspapers, weekly newspapers uh, of other cities. And so when they printed those other newspapers, they made sure that much of their content, much of the content of the Atlanta Daily World was in those papers um, that were distributed in other cities. So that was one way. Uh, and then as I also noted, um, the national media really paid a great deal of attention to the Atlanta Enquirer because they were one of the few new newspapers, unfortunately, one of the few Black newspapers even, reporting what was going on on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of the direct action, the boycotts, the sit-ins, the marches that were being done by the students, but also by others in the community as the movement um, expanded and direct, direct action expanded throughout the South. Uh, and so those were basically the ways, um, their outreach, um, intentional outreach uh, of um, the, the journalists, the, the newspaper, um, uh, newspaper editors, um, and um, through the syndicate. And then again, the Atlanta Voice also um, had a syndicate of sorts, seven newspapers, uh, in different cities. And again, um, much of the content in those other newspapers was um, common content that originated at the Atlanta Voice. Great. Thank you. And we have uh, one other quick one um, mm -hmm. from the audience. Uh, are you familiar with other artifacts beyond Atlanta's Berlin Wall that was started by one of the publications? The Atlanta Berlin Wall artifacts seem to be a very effective in generating conversation. Okay, I, I'm I'm not sure I'm understanding the question that the Berlin Wall, the Atlanta Berlin Wall was created by the white mayor of Atlanta, Ivan Allen, to keep black people out of the white community. So uh, is the question asking if there are other physical um, reminders of, um, of, of racism, systemic racism, uh, because that wall no longer exists. It was dismantled. <laughs> yeah, but, it seems so. Um, the, the, the yeah. much context was added to that. But I think that was a sufficient answer. Thank you. Okay. okay. All right, let's see. I think we have, oh, I think we have out of time. We have time for one more question. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. It says here. Is that the information you presented um, relates to my Black entrepreneurship class. Um, uh, black led um, newspaper article during the early 1930s. Has to be much has to be such a remarkable milestone for African Americans. If we, our ancestors, didn't have access to black-led newspapers, we would have been manipulated by. Okay, it's more like a, a comment. And one person asked also, uh, "What is the title of your book?" He wants to to repeat that. <laughs> well, the the title is "Keep Pushing: The Atlanta Student Movement and the Quest for." civil rights from the quest for civil rights to the demand for black power and it is in progress okay and so again uh, doing presentations like this uh, it, it, it's, it's really it gets me all geared up and excited again because uh, uh you know this is a a, a process uh and um, for the book uh i'm not the only author i'm writing several chapters but i've invited others to write chapters including it will inc include chapters by individuals who are actually a part of the Atlanta student movement. 
uh, such as uh, Mr. Charles A. Black, who I referred to and quoted in my presentation. Amazing. Thank you. We're all looking forward to that book. So that concludes today's <laughs> event. Yeah, we, 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 we love books here. Uh, this concludes today's events. Thank you, everyone, this event. Thank you, everyone, for attending. And thank you, Dr. Myrick Harris. And thank the Keller Center and Princeton University for continuing to enthusiastically support and host this lecture series. It's been remarkable being a part of this. Um, each semester, we have three lectures and a concluding roundtable. So two more lectures remain. The next one is next week, Wednesday, um, November 15th at 1 p.m. Eastern with Dr. Crystal Moten. So please register and attend live if you can to have your questions answered live by the scholars as we did today. Um, and finally, uh, we'd like to remind you that all talks are recorded and can be found on the Keller Center website. So thank you again, Dr. Myra Karras. Today was amazing and um, please keep in touch. Thank you, enjoyed it tremendously. Have a good right. day. Thank you everyone. Take care, bye-bye.